So, um, so the the last bit of the this set of slides go over the what I'm calling standard solar model, and I give you the link here because this is kind of um, umbrella term <laughs> for um, kind of a summary of everything that um, we have figured out about our own sun, and that will be applicable to other stars like our sun. So um, there's quite a bit here, even more than our textbook goes into. So. Obviously, I'm not requiring you to know any uh, all the details here, but I included the link uh, for anyone who might be curious uh, in terms of what you have to know is what we actually cover as reflected in the slides, in the key terms, and in the when it's posted, the module and the questions. Uh, it covers these uh, uh, bits of pieces. The starting place is the, the energy generation. Uh, in the core of the sun is where you have high enough temperature, high enough density that you have sustained the fusion reaction that all, um, that's the source of the energy of the sun. And um, one theme that you will see over and over is this idea of hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, it, this is actually in contrast to one of the earlier ideas, one of the earlier ideas about the the sun's energy actually headed so that the sun is continually shrinking and it's from the shrinking that energy comes. That was one of the early ideas. And the, this uh, assertion about hydrostatic equilibrium is quite explicitly saying that the sun is stable. You are, we don't see it shrinking and for billions, for at least a few more billion, a couple more billion years, we won't be seeing it shrinking. It's uh, at an equilibrium. And um, and this hydrostatic equilibrium comes into play throughout throughout a star's life cycle. So I want you to highlight that. So the rest of slides uh, walk you through it. So you know, take your time looking at it. <laughs> and um, I think this idea about the radiative zone is something worth uh, spending some time thinking through. Your textbook goes in some detail because uh, this is a bit unusual um, from the kind of thing you see in Earth. Uh, most uh, parts of the earth you see convection whenever there's a fluid, but this is the, the smaller portion of the sun where convection isn't occurring uh, for the reasons summarized here and described more in detail in the textbook. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and this is the description of hydrostatic equilibrium. And it's uh, the balance of between the gravitational pull that's trying to shrink everything down to a single point and the pressure, outward the pressure that's, uh, um, that's uh, balancing out the gravity. And what changes throughout the life cycle of a star is what's providing this pressure. Uh, uh, for a star like our own sun, at the, its current stage, the, what pro provides this pressure is the, the gas pressure. The sun is basically a hot gas or hot plasma that has a certain amount of pressure that's associated with its temperature and that's enough to provide the outward pressure. And as uh, more in more massive stars, uh, yeah, more massive stars, <laughs> there's something called the radiation pressure that um, according to the this mathematical model we are building of the stars uh, plays a bigger role for a more massive star. And at a later stage of the sun's life when it's run out of nuclear fuel, um, you will see other physical processes come into play that will provide this pressure. Um, so I think that uh, oh, oh, um, I have one last bit of uh, piece to highlight in some module 4.1 and then move on to the remainder, which is uh, observation of a solar neutrino. Uh, as I keep emphasizing that um, all these mathematical calculations and predictions, they have to be anchored in direct observation of the sun. So we can observe uh, things that are on the sun's surface. And turns out there's one thing that gives us a direct view of even core of the sun, which are the neutrinos, because they go through almost everything. Uh, um, neutrinos that are created in the core of the sun, they come to us almost directly. It doesn't, it's not bouncing around within the sun. Uh, so, so this uh, makes it this uh, unique tool to, 
um, to compare with the model calculation of a solar neutrino, how many neutrinos we should be getting from the sun based on its energy generation and the calculation that's been done based on our understanding of nuclear physics and how many neutrinos we actually detect on earth. And people have done this experiment from uh, early times in the 80s, 90s. And um, this is a summary of what used to be called the solar neutrino problem. The problem being, uh, so this is what uh, predicted, uh, so the, on these graphs, the left-hand side is the theoretical prediction. Uh, for a particular type of detector. So uh, theoretical prediction for a detector using, I guess, chlorine. Um, <laughs> I think it's using some of the nuclear reactions that turns chlorine into something else. Anyway, so for that detector, the theory predicts that this amount of neutrinos should be detected, um, accounting for all the nuclear process the model includes for the sun. And when people have done that experiment and actually uh, looked for it, they only found a third as much. And it kept happening. This is a different detector. Um, theory predicts about this much many neutrinos. And there's again about half or a quarter, a, a third as much. And say, similar here. And um, these detectors are sensitive to different uh, ranges of neutrinos. And when they do theoretical calculation, they account for all that. And they still end up short the uh, experimental detection. And it, this becomes a basis of what might even be called a, 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 a crisis in the terminology of scientific revolution. As in, we have a well-established framework theory that's uh, supposedly able to predict a certain concrete things. And we predict it, we make a measurement, we do experiments, and the theory and experiment that do not agree. And that constitutes a crisis. It has to be resolved one way or another. And um, in the case of the, I think I mentioned this with the example of Neptune, discovery of Neptune. When you have a crisis like that, you have basically two choices. One is the theory might be wrong. <laughs> so the crisis might resolve in a way where the theory is modified and you have a newer, better theory, either something that's a complete, complete upheaval, like from geocentric to heliocentric model, or something that's a modification of existing things, like discovery of a neutrino would fit into the mold. So there's one. And the other possibility is that uh, theory is mostly right, but there was a, some small missing piece that we weren't able to observe. And um, what we, the resolution of this solar neutrino problem um, came out uh, with the, the, the second option. There was a something, uh, a small piece that, um, or I guess you could actually characterize it as one or the other. Uh, it, it led to the modification of a bit of aspect of our nature that we didn't know before, which was that, so before we knew that uh, neutrinos would come in three different flavors, as in, um, in this, oh, I got rid of it, um, in this uh, standard model of particle physics. Um, Ah, uh, shouldn't have clicked on this. <laughs> I should have clicked on this proper. Uh, in the standard model of particle physics, we did have three flavors of neutrinos. Um, what we didn't have up until the late 90s was we thought neutrinos were massless, uh, that uh, they were had a different flavor, but they were, were just, you know, massless, somehow like a, a photon, like light. And in order to resolve this uh, problem, people suggested a mechanism of neutrino oscillation. And for this mechanism to work, neutrinos have to have some mass, a small amount of mass. And, um, and, and, and uh, the, the decades of experiments, measurement led to, yeah, there is a neutrino oscillation. People have actually measured the neutrino oscillation from nuclear reactors, not from the solar neutrinos. So, um, 
so again, this is kind of how scientific process works. Uh, in investigation of one thing, you notice a discrepancy. And you know, our job isn't to explain it away or ignore it. It's to um, investigate it until we find the proper explanation for it. Either there's a, there has to be modification to the theory, or we have to identify something else that we are missing before that would explain it. Um, and this is uh, the kind of final result that uh, resolves the, those discrepancies. The detector that they use here is designed to be able to detect all three flavors of neutrinos and, um, and what they do detect matches up more or less with the prediction. So the standard solar model is fine and, and our nuclear physics is also fine after the inclusion of neutrino oscillation.